We have to have every single mosque in America have armed individuals protecting it. And that saves one soul. I think it's worth it. What are you doing with celebrity chefs? Are you happy? Oh. In a 5-4 decision, the Supreme Court gave the Department of Homeland Security the ability to indefinitely detain legal immigrants while they wait for a hearing on whether they'll be deported for committing certain crimes, even if they'd completed their sentences years ago. The ruling overturns a Ninth Circuit decision that said that the government could only do that if it detained immigrants immediately after they'd been released. Search and rescue teams in Mozambique are struggling to reach victims five days after a cyclone tore through the country submerging villages, sending wreckage flying, and stranding survivors. Beira was the worst hit, with Cyclone Ide destroying 90% of buildings in the city of half a million people, according to the Red Cross. The country's president says more than 200 people have died, but he fears the number could grow to more than 1,000. The longest-serving leader in the former Soviet bloc abruptly announced he's quitting. In his nearly 30 years as Kazakhstan's autocratic president, Nursultan Nazarbayev changed term limit rules to allow himself to be re-elected indefinitely, but he's now giving his job to an ally, the House Speaker. Nazarbayev will still oversee defense as head of the Security Council and keep his formal title of leader of the nation, which grants him immunity from prosecution. California Republican Congressman Devin Nunes is suing Twitter, a Republican strategist, and two anonymous parody accounts pretending to be his mother and his cow, claiming they organized a smear campaign against him. In a complaint filed today, Nunes is demanding $250 million, accusing the Twitter accounts of defaming him and the platform of letting it happen and shadow banning him, a practice Twitter has repeatedly denied. The Republican strategist says that Nunes should face public scrutiny and debate since he's a public official. This is the monster. This is exactly the, our worst nightmare that we prepare against. This is Hassan Shibli, Florida Director of Care, or Council on American Islamic Relations. This is how he and some of his friends wow. found out about the mass shooting in Christchurch. I mean, I gotta do another alert. Hey, salam alaikum everyone on Instagram. Just saw the most horrific, horrific video ever. We need to stand proud, not be afraid, stand strong, and continue to challenge the kind of Islamophobia that led to that horrific attack. Salam alaikum. What went through your mind when you heard about the shooting or when you saw the video? It was unbelievable. It was, I think, extreme anger that you know, you, you see these people who are gathered in a house of worship to worship their creator, and this monster just gunning them down, but they had no chance. I felt a little bit powerless, honestly. As the executive director of Care Florida, what is your response to this? We will encourage the community, number one, take action not to be victims. Next, let's consider people considering arming themselves if they need to, to protect themselves. You know, there's a reason why I carry a firearm, you know, and that's something that I think we're gonna have to continue considering as a, as a means of protection. Why are you carrying a gun right now? What you saw in New Zealand is exactly why I started carrying a gun in June 2016 when Trump was running for office and saying that Islam hates us, later saying he wants to shut down the Muslims from entering the country. Then we're starting to get all these death threats in Florida, we've had several mosques, arson. We've had people attacked in the streets. You know, if somebody's willing to, to firebomb a mosque or physically assault a worshiper walking to a mosque because they hate them because of their religion, they're only one step away from, God forbid, picking up a firearm and trying to uh, cause some real carnage. What we need to do is stand strong, encourage our community to be resilient, to be steadfast, to be courageous, to not be intimidated by those who wish to do us evil to challenge Islamophobia. This is what Islamophobia leads to. But are you concerned about young Muslim males in your community 
who are, because of what's going on, because of the rhetoric by the Trump administration, because of the shooting in New Zealand, that they are going to get have more extremist tendencies. I'm not concerned that this is going to inspire, you know, your average Muslim kid to become extremist. From my experience with the Muslim community, people tend to get scared after such an attack. Uh, and if anything, unfortunately, it has the effect of, okay, hide your faith, hide your identity. You know, it doesn't really lead to, and I think- It, it doesn't it, embolden them sometimes? I think it is a sexy talking point to say, to get the support of the right wing and the conservatives. For me to get their support, I can go on camera and say, listen, I think these attacks that target the Muslim community, they can potentially radicalize young Muslims to become violent, and therefore we need to stop these attacks so Muslims don't become violent. In response to the New Zealand attack, Hassan is mobilizing an effort to put professionally trained armed security guards in every mosque in America. My goal is that as of today, people will really take safety and security more seriously. I'm not for mass arming, but we're gonna be encouraging uh, the Muslim community uh, to take advantage of the safety and security trainings that we've been offering. Hassan was able to organize a training session for the congregants of the Islamic Center with Nazar Hamza, a Broward County deputy sheriff who has himself been the target of anti-Muslim rhetoric. When I saw that video, phew, subhanAllah. However, when I give my safety training, the first thing that I open up with when I give my safety training is what would you do if a shooter walks into this mosque and opens fire? Turn around. What will you do? Tackle. Tackle him. He's been shooting for 10 seconds. On the street, the people that I deal with that prey on the innocent people, they look for weak people. That's the reality. We have rights in this country to protect ourselves. Sa? Sa? If somebody comes in here and opens fire like they did in New Zealand, if somebody is trying to kill you in Islam, what do you have a right to do back? Protect yourself, kill him. Protect yourself. Protect yourself, protect others. Protect others. If you have somebody with a machine gun mowing everybody down, don't talk to me about fighting and defending. You can kill the person. If somebody comes in here to kill all of us, you have a right to kill them. America has failed to address the problem of, of, of uh, gun violence. For the general public to have access to such weapons is, is definitely not in the long-term interest of this country. Right. You know, and I think that's part of the problem. Um, however, so long as dangerous people have access to these weapons, I think, uh, you know, people of conscience, people of faith, uh, need to be able to protect themselves as well. As a precaution, for example, I mean, I'm giving my sermon. I told everybody that, listen, I'm gonna go to that sermon armed, ready to go. Uh, and there's a reason, generally when you're armed, you don't want people to know so that you have the advantage, but I want people to know not to be afraid to defend themselves. Assalamu alaikum. I stand before you with nothing prepared of a sermon for what can we say after witnessing such senseless bloodshed against our brothers and sisters in humanity and in faith. They were the victims of a toxic hatred and Islamophobia that is not new. The killer, the terrorist, he quoted the president in his manifesto to justify his horrific attacks. My brothers and sisters, let us, at this time, remember who we are. We are here because we love our Creator. And no matter what happens to us on the path of seeking our Creator, we are willing to pay the price. We will not allow this to scare us or intimidate us. Rather, we will react by ensuring that our brothers and sisters have not lost their lives in vain. We will react by holding stronger to our faith and our identity. Steadfast, ready to protect ourselves, and with a renewed commitment to share with the world 
the beauty of our faith. We thank Allah for making us Muslims. Nine days after the crash of Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302, all of Boeing's 737 MAX jets have been grounded. No one has any idea when they'll be allowed to fly again. And there are reports that federal investigators are scrutinizing how the plane's design was developed and approved. The 737 MAX represents a big chunk of Boeing's future. 371 of the planes are currently in service, and the company has more than 4,500 orders waiting to be filled. So you'd think the aircraft's troubles would put Boeing in serious hot water. But if the last decade is any indication, big, well-established companies don't just survive product scandals, they thrive. In 2009, Toyota was hit with a flood of complaints that its cars were suddenly accelerating and causing crashes, some of them fatal. Driver error was responsible in some cases, but so were oversized floor mats. Toyota ended up having to recall over 7 million vehicles and paid a $1.2 billion fine. But within three years, its market cap had more than doubled. And today, it's still the best-selling Japanese automaker in the U.S. In 2015, Volkswagen was caught rigging tests to make its diesel engine cars look cleaner than they were. Its CEO stepped down, employees faced criminal charges, and the whole thing cost VW more than $30 billion. But consumers mostly shrugged. Two years later, VW's market cap had nearly doubled, and it now sells almost a million more vehicles a year than it did before the scandal hit. Almost immediately after Samsung launched the Galaxy Note 7, there were reports of phones literally bursting into flames. Samsung recalled 2.5 million phones and discontinued the 7. But when the Note 8 debuted to strong reviews, all was forgiven. There are companies that have been brought down by product problems, like the airbag manufacturer Takata. But those tend to be small companies, or ones with little name recognition among consumers. By contrast, consumers tend to forgive companies with strong brands when they mess up, because they see the scandal as a blip rather than a pattern. Boeing itself proves this rule. In 2013, the FAA grounded its new flagship, the 787 Dreamliner, for four months because the plane's lithium-ion batteries were catching on fire. Boeing fixed the problem, and the $290 million Dreamliner is now a staple of airline fleets. Boeing is also protected because it's one of only two large aircraft manufacturers in the world, so airlines need it to be not just solvent, but healthy. And it's America's largest exporter, which means pretty much everyone in Washington wants it to do well too. But Boeing, like these other companies, will survive mainly because of the forgiveness, or mysterious amnesia, of consumers. Let's say you're an average citizen concerned about the climate. You could yell at a senator. We are now fighting for existence. Or make your kids do it. Can I go in and share this letter in front of Feinstein? But Billy Delancey says he has a better way for the little guy to be heard. Lobbying. Lobbies for Good is a crowdfunding platform that lets everyday people raise money to hire lobbyists in order to get their voice heard and make actual change on Capitol Hill. Well, we'll do our, our standard meeting make sure that we're brief, make sure that we're on point. Laura Reese is one of those everyday people. She's a vegan climate activist who wants to shrink the livestock industry. She found Billy's organization on Reddit. Hi. How's it going? I sent him a pitch for lobbying against animal agriculture subsidies and trying to flip the incentives toward plant-based proteins. Laura's proposal raised $5,000 on the Lobbyist for Good platform, which buys her a part-time lobbyist for one month. Do you find people aligned with these kind of, what you might call do-gooder causes? Are they naturally more resistant to lobbying because of the connotations of it? Oftentimes, people like Billy and Laura, when they get into these issues, they never consider talking to or working with the lobbyists. Uh, they often go in and have talk to members by themselves. They never get real strategy because they're convinced that lobbying is inherently a bad thing. I want to show that this farmer is getting help, but this farmer is not. Yeah. 
A lot of people see lobbying as a way for wealthy interests to buy favors from elected officials. But if you want to get something done in D.C., good or bad, a lobbyist is how you do it. After you. Laura's original pitch was to end all federal subsidies for animal agriculture. A lot of those subsidies end up in the farm bill that Congress takes up every five years. The latest was $867 billion and passed in December. On advice from her new lobbyist, Ron, she instead developed a small pilot program that would offer grants to help livestock farmers switch to growing plants. Sometimes people want to go and the first thing they decide to do is lobby for, to revamp the entire farm bill. It's not plausible. And so what we realize is that we have to take politics and reduce it down to what's meaningful. Yes, lobbyists really do write legislation. Ron wrote the actual language for the pilot program that the group is now shopping on the Hill. And yes, laws really do get started this way. Hi, Congressman. But first they need somebody in Congress to sponsor their legislation. Laura here is an everyday person who used our platform. I've been working with a dairy farmer in Wisconsin. His name's Dan, and he really wants to switch to growing tree nuts on his land. But he can't because he doesn't have any help. And so this pilot program would set up the ability to provide research and opportunities for the best management practices to help other farmers transition. Now in the process, just looking for those members that we can get on board. This would have been something that would have been part of a farm bill. Mm -hmm. That just passed. We are actually starting conversations now about how do we prepare for the next farm bill. Blumenauer has some ideas of his own for how Laura could promote her pilot program. What are you doing with celebrity chefs? But Billy still saw the meeting as a win. If you get stuck talking to a member of Congress, make the best of it. But people like Kevin, I mean, the certified smart people who really young, run the place, right? The staffers play such an important role in the legislative process that having him agree to the th theory of the pilot program in front of his staffer then gives him the green light to go ahead and do the legislation um, that is required to actually get this written into law. I think we're happy to kind of keep in touch with you all. I think we will be supportive of this program. He talked about the farm bill, which, I mean, that's five years off, and I understand getting in early, but to me, um, finding an avenue for legislation for this pilot program, the urgency of global warming, that didn't feel very good to me. This was one meeting of many. The five grand she raised got Laura 35 meetings with Congress and staff. And if she raises another five grand, she gets another month of work from Ron's firm. Why does it not work to say, just go find Nancy Pelosi and scream at her and say, environmental apocalypse is coming, do something? It just doesn't work that way. Natu like Human nature says that I'm gonna be more willing to help you out if I view you as a friend and if I view you as a partner. And for somebody to come in and tell somebody, A, what to do, and to say it's my way or the highway, it gets such a negative reaction from members of Congress. The dairy industry, beef industry, they have tons of money, lots of lobbyists. Are you naive in thinking you can take them on with one lobbyist? There are a lot of people who are cynical about the organization. There have been some pretty stupid crowdfunding campaigns that have raised a lot of money. I think Cards Against Humanity raised $100,000 to dig a hole in the middle of nowhere. The resources are there. I mean, if we all pitch in, we can raise enough money where we are able to hire lobbyists to counter the corporate Thanks, influence. Lovely meeting. Oh. Oh. Do you ever blow it up? Do you blow it up? Oh, yeah, blow it up. It seems faintly ridiculous that Finland would rate as the happiest place on Earth. But for reasons that even confounded Finns, the United Nations 2018 World Happiness Report ranked the Nordic nation number one. The next list comes out tomorrow, meaning today is possibly the last day that Finland holds the title. We visited the reigning champions of joy to see what makes them so happy. Are you happy? Uh, Did you see this story? Yes, I've seen it many times, and uh, I always wonder why, actually. I'm like literally about to kill myself standing in the square for like mm -hmm. 20 minutes. This is kind of a hard country, especially in autumn and winter, you know? yeah. so I mean, it, it takes a lot of 
yeah. something yeah. in our spirit to, to be able to live here. Yeah. This is not working out, by the way. Explain the Finnish person to me, the Finnish quality. We are quite quiet. Yeah. We are quite serious. We like to spend time alone. Suicide rate's kind of high here. But it's, it's getting lower every year. Well... And you like living here? Oh, sometimes. What do you mean sometimes? If you come over here in the summertime, everybody is much more open and happier. And now, in the wintertime, when it's dark and rainy, yeah. and it sucks. So how do Finns battle this demoralizing weather in a country that's drenched in darkness half the year? Well, they just pretend to do happy summer things. That's not warm enough. <laughs> it's legitimately not warm enough. Everyone always thinks about, you know, the, you know, the darkness and how difficult it must be. But when you actually grow up here, you just sort of learn to live with it. But that's rather different than being happy about it, isn't it? When I seen the reviews with the happiest place in the world, it was, it was quite hard for me to understand. <laughs> yeah. The masses might seem sullen, but Finnish happiness researcher Frank Martella thinks the country's top ranking makes a certain amount of sense. There are missions like life satisfaction, and we know from research like that the factors like you know like how wealthy the country is, and also like how broad the social network system is, and how much people trust in the institution, and what is the situation with the democracy. These factors are kind of like things that like tend to predict like high life satisfaction. Countries that scored high on income, life expectancy, and social support, all which contribute to one's sense of well-being, have topped the list for several years running. In other words, if you live in a Nordic welfare state, the UN suspects you're probably happy. One way of like defining measuring happiness is about life satisfaction. How satisfied are you with your life on the whole? And in that kind of measures, Finland seems to be like in the top. But then when you measure happiness with like positive emotions, like joy joyfulness and how much do you smile every day and so forth. Where is Finland on that scale? Not close to the top at all. At the top of that scale are cheerful if impoverished Latin American countries like Paraguay and Guatemala. The problem with the word happiness is that like, you no, know, everybody seems to define it in different ways. As a researcher, I, I, I said that, you know, we should like get rid of the word happiness. What term would you prefer is used? I, I would prefer that we have like few separate words, like positive emotions, life satisfaction, meaningfulness, and like see these and these as, as three separate things. When you walk on the streets in Finland, people don't seem to be particularly happy. And I was actually thinking that that might like actually contribute positively to our sense of satisfaction, because like we know that when we think about our happiness or when we judge our own lives, we are quite much comparing us to the other people. So if you live among people where everybody is kind of advertising their own happiness, like telling that, hey, look at me, how happy I am, that might actually make you like more sad. So after spending some time in Finland, I've determined that the UN is partially right. This country is not particularly happy. Everyone looks pretty grim. But while they're probably not the happiest people on the planet, I think they're the most content people on the planet. That's what Finland is. It's not happy. This is the wrong word. It's a bad translation. Right?